One thing I noticed as an owner of an epileptic dog is that I got better at sensing that he was going to have a seizure. There's just, I can't explain it, maybe you can explain it to me. Before they have a seizure, there's just something. And I think, you know, obviously with people now having support dogs, um, if they are themselves epileptic, that these dogs can sense when their owners are about to have a seizure. Yeah. And that there is this aura that um, that they, they give off. Yeah. Have you had owners comment on that pre period before? Do they, yeah. a lot of people in tune with their, their pets that they can pick this up? There are people who who get good at it. Mm. So and and they pets have had seizures for some time, and and they can get quick, and they can pick up on it. Welcome to another insightful episode on the Pause and Effect podcast. I'm Dr. Kara, your host and a passionate advocate for pet health. And today we're joined by Dr. Peter Hanukom from Hillcrest Veterinary Hospital. Join us as we unravel the mysteries of seizures in pets, exploring their causes and effective management strategies. Welcome back, Dr. Peter Hanukom. Thank you so much for joining me again. Last time we had a discussion on cardiac disease and I was really just totally intrigued. We did touch on our subject for today, which is seizures in pets. So thank you. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yes. So let's start off where we, we left off or where we sort of did a little small touch on seizures. Can, can we determine um, the difference between what some people view as sort of an episode being a cardiac and a neurological episode being a seizure. What is the difference? How do people determine mm. what kind of episode their pets are having? Sure. Yeah, so we talked last time about the heart disease and we talked about the fact that you can get fainting spells or what is called syncopal spells, which is basically a fainting episode. And, and then as opposed to a seizure, and th- th- it can be quite confusing to know exactly what you're seeing now typically with a with a fainting spell it's there's a sudden collapse loss of consciousness and just uh, and 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 they remain flaccid in other words there's no shaking or jerking and then it lasts for a few minutes and they get up and it as if nothing has happened they're completely back to normal as opposed to a seizure where you the typical generalized seizure at least they're also going to collapse uh, they might lose their consciousness and then there's often a stiffness followed by a jerking or shaking of, of the limbs uh, they may also defecate or urinate at the same time and then importantly when they recover for that uh, from that uh, there's what we call a post ictal phase and this post ictal phase is a is a period of days and disorientation and you don't get that with the syncopal or fainting spell. So that's a very important distinguishing characteristic between an actual fainting spell or a seizure. That period of days and disorientation, which can last anything from uh, often a few hours um, to maybe even a day or two sometimes. Um, yeah, so it, it, it can help, and, and, and I would advise, and we'll probably get more into that later on, but um, if you as a, as a pet owner uh, see something like that, um, always try and take a little video on your phone, which you can show the vet. It would be very, very helpful for the vet to understand what actually happened because it can be difficult for pet owners to actually describe what they're seeing, understandably so. It can be quite distressing initially. Yeah, because it is distressing. First... It's very disconcerting and distressing mm-hmm. when it's happening. And at that moment, you just kind of, what on earth do I do here? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you... If you can have the presence of mind just to grab that phone quickly and, and try and videotape, that can help your vet a lot. Absolutely. And how long, generally, if we're talking, um, and, and I'm sure we'll go into the various types of episodes, but how long do these seizures generally last? Yeah, so normally it's going to be maybe a minute or two or so, and and then they relax and it's over. Uh, but, you know, they can last longer, and if they do, then it gets much more serious. Mm. So let's, before we go into um, how to manage them, um, let's go into what are some of the causes, because obviously from my understanding that we can sort of categorize them in, in various sort of um, categories to, to, to try and manage them differently. So yeah. like how, why causes, do you, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so um, in terms of causes, one can think of sort of three broad categories. Um, you get reactive seizures, you get primary and you get secondary seizures. Uh, with reactive seizures, we, we're talking about things where the brain is actually completely normal, but it's reacting to something outside the brain. And that may be something like a metabolic disturbance, like a low blood glucose level or a low blood calcium level. Um, so it's reacting to something outside. Uh, toxins would fall under that category as well. And then we've got secondary seizures. Um, secondary seizures are where there is actually an identifiable brain lesion. So that may be that there was trauma to the brain, which caused some damage to the brain at some time. Maybe there's a brain tumor. It may be that there's actually an infection of the brain. And then you've got the primary seizures where no identifiable reason can be found for it either inside or outside the brain. And in those, we would term uh, primary seizures, um, an epilepsy, or typical primary, what we call primary idiopathic epilepsy, would fall into that category. So no identifiable cause can be identified. It's just abnormal electrical activity in the brain. So from my experience, that is often a rule-out diagnosis because when these patients present we don't know what the, the underlying cause is. But there are certain things that may suggest that it falls into one category versus another. Can you, can you yes. give us some examples? Yeah, so one thing that we always keep in mind is the, the age of the animal. That gives a, a big clue as to what we might be dealing with. For example, uh, dogs under six months of age uh, with seizures are most often going to have uh, an infection. Um, they're going to have maybe distemper uh, in our area we we are. We've got to consider rabies as a possibility. Uh, and then there's some protozoal infections that puppies and young dogs get, uh, things like toxoplasmosis and neosporosis. That's the most common reason for them. In an age group between six months and up to six years, uh, most commonly they're going to have primary idiopathic epilepsy. And then in older dogs, they are more likely to have brain tumors. So age of an animal can give you a good idea. And then there are certain breeds that are predisposed to seizures. And then we think about golden retrievers, laboratory retrievers, um, St. Bernard's, a couple of other breeds in there. But those, once as soon as we see those, and we're more likely to think in terms of epileptic type, uh, primary epileptic type seizures rather than something else. So we take that all into account, uh, and it gives us some clues as to where, we, where do we need to, to look? Start, because <laughs> it yes. can be quite a workup. Yeah. So let us, let us go before we, we go in depth on how owners manage seizures. Let's talk about how we as vets manage a seizure or a seizuring dog that comes in, okay. especially if they arrive. <coughs> seizuring. Seizuring. Yeah. So if they arrive seizuring, our very first thing we have to do is we've got to stop the seizures immediately. And we would place an intravenous catheter. We would administer intravenous anticonvulsants. We would supply oxygen. We would elevate the front part of the body to try and, and uh, limit any brain swelling. And then we would start doing some tests. Uh, we would take some blood tests. Definitely, we would want to look at all those possible metabolic issues. Um, and once, once the patient is stabilized, uh, then we've got more time to work. But we've got to stop the seizures straight away. Uh, if we let the seizures carry on, that can be very dangerous. It can cause serious and irreversible organ damage and even death. Um, and going back onto that, uh, those seizures that carry on for five minutes or longer... I would call that a status epilepticus. So they don't stop seizuring, they just carry on. Uh, those are the really dangerous ones and we've got to stop them immediately. And is that, uh, the obviously, like you say, the organ damage, is that associated with an increased temperature or is that also the electrical you know, one of the, damage? One of the factors is, is you know, it, it has to do with a, this, it has to do with both those factors. Yes, you get an increase in temperature because of the muscle activity and that directly can cause uh, damage. It can cause um, lysis of muscle cells and, some, uh, and, th and then you get kidney damage, for example. You can get heart arrhythmias, you can get uh, fluid on the lungs and you can get irreversible brain damage. Wow. So we're presented with these patients and we will, we will work 
up the case, like you say, in terms of stabilizing them, running some bloods. Um, if we find nothing, what is what is the the Next route? Step. Yeah. yeah, so that's going to depend on, on the patient again. It's going to depend on if it's a dog or if it's a cat. It's mm -hmm. going to depend on, on the age group and the history that we've got. So obviously if we can find something on the tests that we can address, and that may be the cause, and we're going to do that. If we can't, and we've got a, say, a dog in that age group, six months to six years, and we've done all the tests, the blood, blood tests, and we don't find anything, then we can f probably fairly safely assume that we've got a primary idiopathic epilepsy. And at that point, we would probably just start with an anticonvulsant treatment. If we have an older dog, then we're going to think in terms of brain tumors much more likely. And in order to look further into that, you're going to need a CT scan or preferably an MRI scan. Now, it depends a little bit then on discussion between the vet and the owner as to how do we want to manage that. Do we want to go down that road? Do we want to investigate for possible brain tumors? They are fairly common in both dogs and cats. Some of them can be removed. Uh, there are specialist practices in South Africa that will do it. Uh, so that is there. Not all of them can be removed. But it is obviously a, a difficult and expensive road to go down. So for, uh, for a lot of vets in general practice, uh, it will be a, a case of managing seizures with anticonvulsants um, unless the owner wants to then take diagnostics further. Hey there, pet owners, it's Dr. Kara here, taking a short break from my podcast recording to share my excitement about a recent discovery, the Huntley Urban Bolster Dog Bed, a new favorite amongst my dog companions, especially Maverick, the Golden Retriever. It's crafted locally in Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, and this bed combines style and functionality seamlessly. Maverick monopolizes it, and I can see why. The durable linen look cationic material with a riptic base not only looks great, but it also offers water resistance, perfect for those slobbery mouths and an ideal recommendation for my incontinent patients. The raised sides provide dogs with security and comfort that they crave, and the reversible middle pillow with its cationic material on the one side and soft shell fleece on the other ensures that they are cozy no matter the season. And let's not forget about sustainability. The dog's bed inner is made from recycled polyester fiber, a choice I feel good about as both a pet owner and a veterinarian who really cares about our planet. And if you're in the market for a stylish, comfortable and eco-friendly bed for your dogs, you can look no further than the Urban Bolster Dog Bed. And here's the cherry on top for our listeners. You can get 20% off this bed from the Huntley website using the unique checkout code Pause and Effect 20 but act fast. This offer is only valid until the end of May 2024, and the details are in the episode description below. Before we proceed, let's discuss a vital aspect of feline care, catering to senior cat's needs. Allow me to introduce UltraPet's Optimal Balance Senior Cat Food, meticulously crafted to meet the unique needs of aging feline companions. The specialized formula features a balanced blend of nutrients, including 34% protein, 12% fat, and 4% fiber, ensuring your senior cat receives the optimal nutrition as they age. With a delectable chicken and rice flavor, UltraPet ensures that even the most discerning senior cats will enjoy their meals. Plus, the vacuum-coated kibbles deliver a taste experience that will keep your cat coming back for more. What sets the senior cat food apart is its thoughtful formulation. With added taurine to promote good eyesight and healthy cardiac activity, your aging companion can enjoy their golden years with vitality. Made with fresh meat, this food provides a better source of healthy protein, while essential vitamins and minerals from VitaCat supports overall health, body function, and immune system protection. For ongoing dental health, the inclusion of calcium and phosphorus help protect your senior cat's teeth. Plus, the optimal mix of omega-3 and 6 fatty acids support a shiny coat and a healthy skin. UltraPet's Optimal Balance Senior Cat Food is available in 2 kgs and 4 gate G packs, providing the perfect solution for senior cats transitioning into their golden years. Give it a try and ensure your senior companion enjoys a healthier and more active life. Your pet will thank you and you'll appreciate UltraPet's dedication to feline well-being. Now, let's return to our conversation. So 
Let's talk about um, the management the, of, of these epileptic patients with medication. Um, I've obviously been discussing a case with you recently. Um, there are obviously there are medications that you will start them on, um, and that can be down to sort of individual animals or um, owner preference in terms of how frequently they potentially have to administer these meds. But I, um, I, I owned my own, you know, I owned my own dog that was epileptic. And I think one thing I really stress when I have clients who are talking to me about seizures is that we are not going to be stopping them having seizures yes. that really the aim is to increase the period of time between seizures that they're going to continue to to likely have fits we just don't want them to happen particularly frequently what for you is a reasonable um sort of uh, period between one seizure and mm. another how what is the mm. aim generally when you're managing mm. these cases yeah there's no real absolute golden rule about it um if we look at it from the point of view as to when treatment is, is indicated for seizures, the, the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine has some guidelines, and they would say that if you have a seizure, any one seizure that lasts for five minutes or longer, or if you have what we call cluster seizures, you have, a, say, two or three seizures that happen in, in short succession in 24-hour period, or you have more than two individual seizures in the six months. So that's quite a long period. Mm -hmm. So that's probably where we then would aim for, is to have at least no more than two, maybe three events in over a six-month period. If we can get to that point, then we're probably doing okay, because you're quite right. We are never going to, almost never going to achieve a state of complete seizure-free with medication. We are trying to get to an acceptable level and frequency of seizures. But there are very few patients which become seizure-free completely. Um, and then uh, for those ones who, who do become seizure-free, we might try and take them off medication. Uh, but we wouldn't do that until they've at least been seizure-free for, for a year okay. or longer. And we might try and actually take them off the medication. And there are some dogs that can actually go off medication but saying that, there are also breeds that are more difficult to control seizure-wise. Certain breeds are, are just known. We don't know what the reason for that is, but we know that they are harder to get the seizures under control. And you don't want to really stop medication for those guys either. And by the way, for those breeds, and I'll mention a few of them just now, uh, even if they had one seizure, you would start them on seizure medication. You wouldn't even go with those guidelines I mentioned just now. One seizure is enough for those guys to get them on seizure medication straight away. And those would be uh, German Shepherds, Australian Shepherds, Border Collies, what's on there as well, St. Bernard's, I think it's on that list, but there's a few of them, and Golden Retrievers. Uh, one seizure, put them on medication. Wow. And so let's take the, the example that you gave that you've got, um, whether it's financial or just you know, owners going, oh, I'm just not in a position to administer daily medication to my my dog, and they haven't had a seizure for over a year. I'd like to see whether we can stop it. Is it a case of tapering that? Um, so sort of how yeah. how are the, are the, are the, the medications generally? Yeah. The fact that they are daily, um, how important is it firstly to give it daily, and how would you discontinue it if you were going to discontinue it? Yeah, so there are various types of medications that, that we use um, and some of them you can stop more abruptly than others. For the others, it's definitely a, a weaning off process where you're going to go a little bit slowly. Um, so it depends on the, on the, the type of medication they're on. Um, for, for many epileptic patients, they, they might be on more than one medication as well. So you might stop one of the medications, carry on with the other one, and see how you go. Mm. But again, it's, it's no, there's no absolute and golden rule about it. It's going to be depending on the patient, what you're managing, what the expectations are, and what medications they have been on. And what do you find um, is the driver behind owners saying, I'd really like to discontinue the medication? Do you find it's more a financial thing or it's a, it's a time factor in terms of the, the rigorous... Uh, yeah, I, I think... I think Mostly, what I come across is that people become a bit complacent. 
So they've been giving the, the medication for quite a long time and things have been going well. Um, maybe there is an, an odd breakthrough seizure, but they may not even be aware of it because it may happen when they're away from home. So they might assume everything is going very well and then they, they stop. Um, and they often stop without telling the veterinarian that they're stopping. Um, and then, of course, uh, the seizures will different, often start again. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just more complacency. Um, I don't think expense is a big factor. Um, a lot of the medication that we can use is actually quite inexpensive. There are expensive ones as well, more expensive ones. It depends again. But there are certainly inexpensive alternatives that one can use. Okay. Yeah, no, I think it's it's always far easier if you, you find with owners when there's a problem that they are treating rather than trying to prevent something happening. Because like you say, I understand the complacency because when something's not happening, you think you don't need to use the, the mm. medication. Yeah. So I suppose it takes me to, or it's a good point for me to um, ask you, when owners are either for the first time or they, they know that their dog's experiencing seizures, how they ought to manage these episodes at home what is the oh. advice that you provide okay well i think the first thing is don't panic when it's happening so it, it is disconcerting and especially if it's the first time it happens it's scary it's disconcerting but it's not usually dangerous because normally it will only last for a minute or two and it'll be over with this in the, in those cases the, the seizure itself isn't dangerous um, I would suggest that um, what, what the biggest thing that could happen is that because of involuntary movement, they may injure themselves, they may bump into something, they may fall off furniture or something like that. So if you're there and you can observe, you can take something like a big blanket or a towel and maybe just wrap them in that so they don't hurt themselves. I'd be careful of going near the mouth because they may have involuntary biting movements. You, you could get bitten. So be careful for that. Uh, and then just wait a little bit and let things calm down. Um, as I said, if, if you've got the presence of mind, take a little video as well. I would make an appointment with the vet as soon as possible. It does need to be checked. They need to, you need to go through with, with your vet what to do from that point, and what test uh, do they want to do, what should be done, what, you know, what sort of possibilities are we looking at. Yes, that discussion needs to happen. Mm. Um, the exception to, the, to that is when you've got what you mentioned before, that state is epilepticus, so we've got a seizure that is now lasting five minutes or longer, or you've got these cluster seizures, one seizure after another. That's an emergency. When that happens, you drop everything, you get to your bed straight away, because if you don't, there's a good chance your animals, your pet's going to die. Mm. And it's often very difficult with those patients, isn't it, to to sort of get them back. Yes, yeah, so those those animals are um, continuing to seizure. Um, uh, I think one study has shown that even if they get to the hospital, only 25% of them are going to survive mm. to go home. Mm. It's that serious. Even with intensive care in the hospital, mm. only 25% of them are sure. going to survive. That's quite a statistic. Yeah. And then it's quite interesting, you know, um, and the one thing which is not easy for us, um, or for most vets to really... Uh, know for sure but it's been shown that you, you can have convulsive and non-convulsive seizures um, and that is when you've, you've got an animal you, you they're seizuring you treat those seizures by saying administering your, your intravenous anticonvulsant and they looks like they, it looks like they've stopped seizuring there's no more movement there's no more there's no, no jerking there's no shaking um, they usually just remain in sort of a state of semi-consciousness or stupor. Yeah. If you connect an EEG to their brains, you're going to see that they're actually still seizuring. Wow. So the EEG is going to show these epileptic form uh, changes, electrical activity ongoing. In the brains, they're still seizuring. Wow. And those are the really, really hard ones. So generally, we don't know when that's happening because... Certainly in general practice, we don't have EEGs that we're going to connect to do dogs' brains. But it's a real thing and it happens. And we often come across cases where we, we seemingly treat these seizures and that animal remains in a stupor mm. uh, or, or unconscious. And then we can suspect that that may be what's happening. Uh, and then I, I also, I'd like um, you to explain the difference for the listeners between um, at the jerky... Um, a normal sort of typical seizure that people see and what 
is referred to as a focal seizure. So what is a yeah, focal so, seizure? Yeah, so we could generalize seizures, which is a, the typical seizure involving involves the whole brain, therefore the whole body. So that's the typical one which you described earlier on. But then you get partial focal seizures where only one part of the brain is seizuring and therefore only one part of the body will be reacting. So you may just have an ear twitching or an eyelid twitching or a whisker twitching or a limb twitching. You may have what we call... Um, uh, chewing gum fits, which are repeated uh, chewing movements, or fly biting or fly gazing, where they either bite at, or stare at imaginary objects, um, and those are those are more common in cats. Um, cats are more likely to have focal or partial seizures than generalized okay. seizures. Wow. Um, and another thing with cats with partial seizures is they they may have a sudden bout of uncontrollable running, jumping, bumping into objects. So not just a cat. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> sometimes that's just a cat, and especially young, youngish kittens can, mm-hmm. can have bouts of behavior like that. But if you've got an older cat that never used to do something like that, and suddenly they get these bouts of crazy running around the house like and manic. jumping into stuff and climbing up the curtains, that could actually be a seizure. Wow. So let's... Um, Let's talk about um, some of the the toxicities that you spoke about before. Obviously, when I first started practicing in South Africa, I was very used to seeing epileptic pets um, in general practice in the UK. But when I started here, one of the things, obviously, typical Sunday, is that we would see these animals rushed in. And there was often a sort of very intentional sort of um, poisoning of dogs or an unintentional poisoning in cats where mm. f- tick and flea treatment was incorrectly yes. administered. Can you give us like yeah. a couple of maybe one dog and one cat of, of yeah. the kind of reasons why um, these... Toxins. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there are many, actually many toxins that can cause seizures. Um, the t- more typical ones are going to be pesticides like organophosphate pesticides and snail bait, for example. <clears throat> and then other things like which one might not think about would be things like chocolate poisoning because those can cause seizures as well. And even uh, xylitol. And xylitol will do it because it's dropping the blood glucose. And so those are fairly common toxicity reasons we see in dogs. And cats, probably, yes, which you mentioned the most, common one is a dog flea product containing pyrethroids have been applied to a cat um, and inadvertently mm-hmm. <laughs> usually yes. uh, um, and yeah that, that's that's a common one with cats yeah mm. yeah no I've, I've found that quite and, and those generally when you manage the the case and you remove or you, you put them fluids and try and stabilize and support them those are generally the ones where you will not tend to get seizure activity yes. longer term? Yeah, no, usually those ones, I uh, successfully get them through it, um, they should be fine. You wouldn't expect long-term effects there. Okay. So, you know, let's let's also talk about the the old dogs. You, you say, obviously, there, there may be um, sort of brain sort of lesions. Do you get any um, seizure activity associated with any organ failure? Are they... Okay. Yeah, you can. So, um, and that will fall under the metabolic reactive kind of seizures. So, for example, with kidney disease, you may get buildup of toxic chemicals in the blood, which can do it. And the same thing with liver disease, liver failure in particular, uh, you can get chemicals, that, certain chemical building up in the blood, which can cause the seizures in the brain. So, yes, mm-hmm. certainly with organs. Okay. And they are obviously. Um, medications that you will start them on primarily, um, like you say, taking into account various things with owners like, you know, sort of finance, the, how frequently they're able to administer these meds, um, and also sort of expectations. Potentially, you can use various medications together, is that right? And yes. so when you have um, a patient that is not responding very well to medication, you can... There are options. This is what I'm asking you: is is it, it's not the end of the road when you mm. find that you have a patient that's not doing very well on one medication. Mm. There are options. Yeah, there are options. Yeah, so there's a good number of different anticonvulsants that work in different ways. So normally, if it's a first time, we would put them on one type of medication, and different vets may have different preferences to which they want to use as a first line 
mm-hmm. treatment. But certainly if it's not well controlled, then one will add another medication and some dogs need three medications. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they, they are, most, most can be controlled. And how frequently are you asking to see these, assuming that um, the seizures are under control, how frequently are you asking for these patients to come back and see you? Um, again, I don't think there's a golden rule about it. Um, for me personally, um, I, initially I would want to see them back within a two weeks or so and have a look. And uh, it also depends on which medication they've been put on. So some of those medications we need to do some blood tests to measure the concentration levels in the blood. Um, for some others we, we don't have to, I can put it that way. Um, but some we do. So for those ones we would on a more regular basis, have to get them back in to do the to the blood tests. Mm. And would you say that ha- having let's talk epilepsy rather than the toxic causes? But would you say that having an epileptic dog, for example, means that they're going to have a shorter lifespan? Do you find that these mm. these pets don't live as long? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as as far as I as far as I understand, uh, there. There is evidence that's shown that seizures can shorten lifespan. And certainly if they are not well controlled, it will definitely shorten lifespan. If they are well controlled, then we can live a long and fairly normal life. But yes, the short answer is it, it can and it does affect lifespan. Mm. So one of the things um, that I've discussed with a client before is um, this whole... the, the potential reasons why they may not survive is that often these dogs are attacked by the other dogs in the household. Is this happening because it's unusual behavior and they, it's this sort of pack mentality to sort of, do you find that a lot of your seizuring patients are, are not well received by the other animals in the, mm. in the household? You do come across that from time to time. Mm. Certainly have people telling me that, um, why are they doing it? I don't really know. I, 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 it, it must have something to do with their pack mentality, as you mentioned. Mm. Um, why they would gang up on that poor animal, I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, probably that instinctual, they're not safe. <laughs> and in terms of, obviously, you, you're very careful about um, discussing sort of side effects and things. Are, are there any side effects owners can expect on on some of this medication, or do, is it generally mm. well received? Um, yes, yeah, so certainly some of the medications um, can cause sedation, um, especially initially when you start using it, and some of them uh, can potentially cause damage to the liver, for example, and that's one reason why you have to do the tests to check for that sort of thing. So it, it depends. Um, there's one particular medication that can cause dry eye, for example. Um, so. Yes, so depending on which medication you're using or medica- or more than one, you'd have to keep those things in mind and be aware of it and monitor for it. And work closely with your vet uh, if you... Uh, yes, yeah. Um, now that you mentioned that, I'm just remembering about diet. And uh, people sometimes ask me, is there something they can do diet-wise to help? Um, and uh, it turns out, there might be. Um, you might be able to tell me more <laughs> about that. <laughs> but um, they found that um, feeding diets with diets that are high in medium chain triglycerides, MCT diets, are they are what we call ketogenic. So they they um, more ketones are being produced when, on these diets, and ketones can act as an energy source for the brain. Uh, when, when seizures are happening, it interferes with glucose metabolism, and glucose metabol- metabolism is the main way the brain gets its energy. So the thing has got something to do with the alternative source of energy, the ketones, which can then be used by the brain. It has been shown to reduce the frequency and severity of seizures. Oh, so I, I don't know of any. I don't know of any next commercial topic. Exactly. I, yeah, I'm not aware of any commercially available diets that 
that are uh, targeting mm. targeting that as such, but there is research that has shown that it actually does help. So maybe something for mm, you to look you. into. I will, definitely. <laughs> so I think it brings me to the point of, especially the mention of food, which we'll talk about the, the post-ectal period, is one thing I noticed as an owner of an epileptic dog is that I got better at sensing that he was going to have a seizure. There's just, I can't explain it, maybe you can explain it to me, that there is also this pre-ictal, so before they have a seizure, there's just something. And I think, you know, obviously with people now having support dogs, um, if they are themselves mm. epileptic, that these dogs can mm. sense when their owners are about to have a seizure. Yeah. And that there is this aura that um, that they, they give off. Mm. Um, so there's this pre-ictal period, a period where they're obviously seizure mm. and then a post-ictal period. Like, what have you had owners comment mm. on that preictal period before? Do they do mm. a lot of people in tune with their, their mm. pets that they can pick this up? Not many. No. Um, there, there are there are people who who get good at it. Mm. So and and their pets have had seizures for some time, and and they can get quite and they can pick up on it, mm. and they might pick up that fluffy is suddenly very attention seeking or or fluffy is going to hiding behind the couch and and that's not normal for them mm. and that is those sort of things if you are observant you can pick up on it um but not many people do because it you know you, you might just not catch on that something is going on mm. but yes uh, in in people certainly people with seizures can very often themselves feel that the seizure is coming on and they will know mm. um and why those support animals can pick up on it I don't think anybody knows That's how incredible. they do that. Mm. If they're picking up on subtle behavioral changes, yeah. how they pick up. I don't know if anybody knows. Yeah, it's interesting. So, so then let's talk about the post-ectal period because um, what I noticed, obviously, um, myself um, with my dog and what a lot of people comment about is they're just so hungry afterwards. Mm. Um, is that because of... The, the drop in glucose do you think or do you think that it's a neurological thing that you know people often go is it okay for me to to feed them afterwards because they're ravenously hungry that's one of the signs that I kind of becomes um, a quite a topic of conversation with these seizuring mm. patients mm. Yeah, people do bring that up yes mm. um, um, I have to be honest with you I really have no clue about mm. that I don't know why that would be the case it could have something with the blood glucose I suppose um, but no, I Unless don't know. Unless it sets off something in the brain. Well, again, another research topic for me. So, so pre, during, and and post. I think you know, other than um, them potentially being attacked during the thing, like you said, covering them, may, like maybe even turning down the lights may help. Just less stimulation from from light and and sound. Um, certainly, not not panicking, putting your hand near. One of the, the things I've been asked before is, can dogs swallow their tongues? So one of the, the things associated with with people having um, epileptic events is the mm. concern that they're going to swallow their tongue. And um, we obviously, mm. we don't have that. And we have had a couple of incidents where people put their hands yeah. in. Sure, in yeah, mouth. certainly that. I, I haven't come across it myself um I have come across dogs that bit their own tongue and and and, yes, and, and, start, and it can bleed quite profusely sometimes um that i've seen yes but i haven't seen them i suppose when when they say swallow the tongue it means the tongue sort of revert, uh, turning over into the back of the throat um i haven't personally come across that no mm -hmm. no i don't i don't think from an anatomical perspective that dogs can maybe cats more. can so um what is your advice in terms of like it's obviously a really big thing for owners to take on uh, taking on a epileptic let's talk epileptic you can't necessarily avoid the other things um do you find that it's it's an inherited condition is it worth um is it something that that breeders will will be transparent about is it mm. something that people yeah, can so, try uh, and prevent pr primary idiopathic epilepsy is considered a genetic disease so it runs in the family. Mm. Um, I don't want to say too much about the breeders. I, think no. that I <laughs> guess a good breeder should be on top of it and a good breeder should be aware of it. They've got lines of 
families with seizures, they, they need to be aware of it. And I suppose reporting back is also a way of communicating that because mm. you know, this could be three years later. That yeah, yeah. so they may not be aware of it uh, until they get some feedback from people who have taken on some of the uh, animals from their kennels. Mm. Um, but yeah, it is, it is something that potentially, because it's considered a genetic disease, can potentially be, be bred out. Mm. Yeah. And so just wrapping up, like a take-home message for, for people who experience the seizure for the first time, um, what would be the, the, mm. the advice you leave us with? Uh, some of the things I've said earlier, but I think in short, if it's a first-time seizure, uh, don't panic, stay calm, realize that it's not usually serious unless it's lasting for longer than five minutes. Uh, Stay calm, let it settle, make an appointment with your vet, let them have a look at things. If it's lasting for longer than five minutes, it's an emergency, catch you the vet. But keep in mind that uh, a lot of the time seizures can be treated, they can be managed, and a lot of pets with seizures can live quite happily and can live quite normal lives. So that you don't have to, it's not sort of the end of the road for these these pets that they... Many of them can live quite well. Um, you know, obviously, our exceptions, um, an old cat with a brain tumour, it's got a worse mm -hmm. prognosis than a three-year-old staffy with uh, idiopathic epilepsy. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all the insights. It's You're really a great discussion about seizures. That's my pleasure. Really great to have you back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us on this valuable journey into seizures in pets with Dr. Peter Hanekom. Your support fuels our mission to empower pet owners with knowledge. Please support the podcast by liking, sharing, and leaving us a review. Don't forget to tune in to future episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube for more valuable insights into pet health. Welcome back to Just for Pets. You're with Dr. Cara. Hello, Doctor. It's Chanel the Persian. And, um, I can't seem to stop retching to get this hairball up. Are you on a special diet? Excuse me? Hairball control food will really help. And maybe some laxapate. And lucky for you, Just for Pets have a big range. Well, how early can I get some? Order today and we'll deliver pronto. Wow! I feel better already. Just for pets.co.za. Vet approved, pet adored. Get it all to your door. We have an exciting announcement to make. We are looking for guest speakers who are passionate about the pet industry and sponsors to support future episodes. Are you an expert in pet training, nutrition, or behavior? Maybe you're a veterinarian with insights to share, a pet store owner with unique experiences or a pet product inventor. We want to hear from you. The Pause and Effect podcast is a platform for industry professionals like you to showcase your knowledge, experiences, and stories. As a guest speaker on our podcast, you'll have the opportunity to share valuable information, engage with our audience, and have your voice heard in the pet community. Whether you want to discuss training techniques, emerging pet care trends, or the importance of mental stimulation for pets, we want to feature you and your expertise. So, if you're passionate about pets and have something to say, we invite you to join us on an upcoming episode of the Pause and Effect podcast. But wait, that's not all. The Pause and Effect podcast is also seeking sponsors to support our mission of educating and entertaining pet lovers worldwide. By becoming a sponsor, you'll gain exposure to our engaged audience and have your brand associated with the love and care that we have for our four-legged friends. If you own a pet-related business, offer pet products or services, or simply want to align your brand with our pet-loving community, we'd love to partner with you. As a sponsor, your brand will be featured prominently in our episodes and our social media channels. It is a great opportunity to showcase your offerings to a dedicated audience of pet enthusiasts. So whether you're an expert in the pet industry looking to share your knowledge, or a business seeking to reach a pet-loving audience, we want to hear from you. To apply as a guest or to inquire about becoming a sponsor of the Pause and Effect podcast, please contact me at drkara at pauseandeffect.co.za. Get in touch and let's discuss the various opportunities. Thank you for joining us today. We can't wait to welcome our future guest speakers and sponsors to the Pause and Effect podcast. Remember, every episode is an opportunity to celebrate our four-legged friends.